What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Geigenomics. A quick announcement before we begin. Uh, I want to mention that next week I will be doing the first ever Geigenomics book review next Tuesday on Why You Should Be a Socialist, written by Nathan J. Robinson, editor of Current Affairs. And I will be going over this book in in in-depth analysis of everything I like and I don't like. And I think a more accurate title for the book would, would be, be why you should be a libertarian socialist as uh, the author fails to give an accurate description of uh, what a socialist is in the different varieties of, of a Marxian socialist or, or a anarcho-socialist. And, and I think he's actually a libertarian socialist. Um, now going into it, uh, I want to mention something that's personal to me and what that is is something that i actually advocate for and this is breakfast food wrapped in flour tortillas now uh some might say this is a breakfast burrito i would agree this is indeed a breakfast burrito and recently i went to the lovely penguin cafe best breakfast in laguna beach is what it says on the menu. And uh, I'll throw this picture of the menu on the screen. But you have on this menu your beverages, your traditional breakfast, your omelets, your breakfast sandwiches, uh, your spicy food, and vegan options, and so on. And what I want to talk about is that prices are exchange ratios. They are the ratio of the capital, uh, the scarce capital to a monetary unit that is also uh, a ratio to the other scarce goods in, in the economy. And from looking at this menu... We could see that the cost of milk is two dollars and ninety five cents, and the cost of a chili and cheese omelet is twelve dollars and sixty five cents, and uh, the cost of a uh, sunrise melt is nine dollars and fifty five cents. But what do these prices mean, or why are they important? And what why they're so important is because, uh. People will often criticize a market economy saying that um, that uh, people are motivated by money. And this isn't a very nice thing. Instead, people should be more moral and uh, have uh, moral standards and, and pay workers a living wage and avoid charging high prices for necessities. Um, essentially... Uh, offering more fair prices. Um, now, uh, you'll have a, a traditional libertarian say, well, this isn't very ethical. You know, the means to imposing these new prices require government intervention, and this is um, unethical on the business owners. And this is a great argument, but this is not in economics what we need to spend our time arguing. What we need to spend our time arguing about is... Um, in uh, a scientific manner of using uh, value-free claims and descriptive analysis of what uh, prices actually mean. You know, um, a fair price has no um, moral direction. What is fair? There, that's it's 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 so undescriptive it's so blank and um it doesn't say much instead what we need to discover is why we have market prices and why they're so important and um uh mises essentially says that the failure to charge market prices will cause surplus and shortages and 
um, my notes today are coming from the every the lecture Everyday Logic of Economics from David Gordon. Um, this is a, a great supplemental and more in-depth uh, descriptive lecture of most of the stuff I'll be talking about in this podcast episode. But to continue, um, Mises says that the failure to charge market prices will cause surplus or shortages. And when Mises points this out, he's not making a value judgment. He's pointing out what is required for economic calculation. The people advocating for living wages and fair prices don't give a criterion of what the correct prices or wages should be. They don't have any rules for what prices are, and this will lead to chaos in the economy. Mises says we need market prices for economic calculation. We're not going to get them without the entrepreneur pursuing profit. And the pursuit of profit is the profit motive. Because a person wants to receive profits, he is at the will of the consumers to meet the consumer demand. If he fails to meet what the consumers demand, then he will go out of business as he cannot receive a profit. And in this way, this is how uh, the dynamic fluctuation of of uh, consumption and production allocates society's scarce resources to the most desired ends um, that people want. And um, we have to understand that w- when Mises it says we need economic, we need market prices for economic calculation, this is a descriptive and scientific statement. It's either true or false. This is not a value judgment of I like the free market, although Mises may definitely like the free market. This is not his claim. Uh, this is what are the consequences of a particular policy. And so um, what we're going to go into in this podcast in a, a second or a little bit is a uh, proposition, uh, Proposition 21 in California, which is to pass rent control. But before we get there, I want to cover a little bit more on the concept of interventionism and interventionism is when the government does not abolish the market but passes laws that restrict the market in certain ways and um, some examples of of interventionism are price controls which uh, is typically a maximum price but not always and it's uh, you could have a price control in practically anything water gasoline um, uh, housing food etc uh rent control is another example of uh, in intervention and tariffs um minimum wage uh which is a a price control but at a minimum price so it's a price floor and what's important for us to understand is that each intervention in the economy creates a distortion and so with each distortion the government will try to correct it by another intervention and that's why what we have today is not a capitalist society. It's a heavily well-regulated um, uh, 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 mixed economy or, or a crony capitalist economy. Um, so it's it's not necessarily a market economy. You don't have um, minimal barriers of entry uh, or, or um, free entry into the production of uh, the provision of a good or a service. Think about anything. You need a license or or a, um, a certificate of some sort, uh, pass all these FDA approved regulations, all this stuff. So this this uh, results in the quasi monopoly or the corporatism, if you will, where corporations are the produ- providers of, of goods and services and, and uh, it's not a market economy. So to continue, um, we, we want to look at, uh, price control. And so going back to the notes here, suppose that the government thinks that the price of milk is too high at the high price, the poor find it hard to buy milk. The government decides to impose a maximum price on milk to make it easier for the poor to buy milk. Um, but what will happen at the lower price, more milk will be demanded by consumers but suppliers won't supply more. And so this is going back to Econ 101, where um, in equilibrium, but there's no such thing as equilibrium, but for the sake of the graph, where supply meets demand, you have equilibrium. And if you artificially lower 
um, or uh, if you artificially lower the price to a uh, a lower price, then what you'll have is a higher quantity demanded, but a lower um, or at the same level of supply. And so uh, what will happen at the lower price will be that more more uh, milk will be demanded by consumers, but suppliers won't supply more. So uh, Mises assumes that people in the business don't at all earn the same return that they would do so in equilibrium. And so what this means is that the marginal sellers, those making the least return, will leave the business of selling milk altogether. And we're using the example of milk because that's what Mises uses. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's delicious. So, um, what is the result of the price control? As a result of the government's action, less milk is available, and this is was not what the price control was supposed to do. This is an example of a criticism that doesn't make a value judgment. One case where a shift wouldn't occur during uh, rent control, uh, resource, where the resources in one particular line of work are completely specialized in that industry, where they can't move to another line of work um, so they would still remain uh, although the issue of uh, a, a more consumers demanding the product um, would still have to be uh, 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 confronted and so um, and so okay so so we're gonna go into rent control now and I'm gonna play this video of the proposition 21 and um we will watch that now the covid 19 pandemic threatens to devastate our housing market once again with millions of people out of work and wondering how they'll pay the rent now more than ever californians need stability and security rent control will help millions of families stay in their homes by limiting rent increases and protecting affordable housing and it will discourage wall street investors from buying up our homes keep families in their homes vote yes on prop 21 this november so using the example of the price control on milk exactly the same process takes place with rent control the aim of rent control is to make more housing available for the poor at the rent controlled price more housing is demanded than is available and landlords who can't make money will withdraw housing from the market uh, and avoid or avoid making repairs um what this means is that when you impose rent control at first it sounds uh as as this video provided that um it protects the 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 pricing of um uh by limiting rent increases and protecting affordable housing um and it will discourage wall street inventor investors uh So, the idea is that the rent control will help millions of families stay in their home. Um, but what will happen if rent control is passed is that the marginal sellers of rent will not be making the same amount of profit. And yes, on tw on Proposition 21, it says, well, they'll be able to make a fair profit. But again, a fair is an arbitrary determination. And if the owners of the housing can make a more profitable business in another line of work, then they will withdraw their housing um, from the market. So with rent control, at cheaper prices of, of rent, more people will be demanding the rent. However, what will happen is that there will be some uh, um, people uh, within the, the housing market that will need to make repairs on their land and so what they might do is charge different types of bills to their tenants uh rent uh reparate repar um repair bills or utility bills and um then if if tenants um don't pay this then repairs won't be made and uh if the prices don't come hit from another hidden way, um, we'll have a lower supply of housing. 
And and what we really have to understand is why, how did housing get so expensive? Because you have this artificial uh, subsidies of uh, the government providing housing. And so this increases the demand of housing. And so um, also with these uh, faulty loans, um, all this stuff goes into driving up the cost for housing. Um, this is the same thing with, with college. Uh, all these... Uh, loans um, increase the the supply of students going into college and this increases the demand and this increases the prices so um and now I'm not saying that people shouldn't have homes but what I'm saying is that this is 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 uh not going to this this is gonna remove housing altogether from uh not all of it but a large portion of it this this doesn't help the issue of of um homelessness if you will or uh, protecting uh a low income um or poor more poor people who who uh um it does the exact opposite of what it's intended to do and um this is very unfortunate um And uh, this is the same with with minimum wage laws. Um, so the term living wage uh, meant uh, that that a worker would be paid enough so he will be able to live and support a family. So the minimum wage advocates would say some wages don't permit workers to do that. And if they impose a minimum wage law, this again creates a price floor where if the minimum wage is set at $15 an hour and a person's marginal productivity is only at $10 an hour, then the worker won't be hired. Um, and, and what we have to understand is uh, that um, uh, it's, it's, it's this difference between capitalism, corporatism, um, crony capitalism, interventionism, and uh, uh, that ultimately minimum wage hurts not only the business, but it, it also hurts the poor. And we can understand really the concept of capitalism um, and the, the idea of the rising tide when we look at the effects of taxation. Many people favor very heavy taxes on the rich. And Mises points out that those taxes make it more difficult for the rich to save and build up accumulations of capital. He says it's uh, tying the entrepreneur's hands behind his back. If capital grows, this raises the productivity of workers. This makes wages rise. So if um, capital grows, you have more money to be invested and allocated efficiently into businesses or uh, production. And this new technology allows one one worker to be more productive than um, without this technology. And so his marginal productivity increases. Now he's able to demand a higher wage to compensate for all the productivity he is able to achieve. And so this helps the poor people. Now, one might say, well, this new technology will eliminate um, multiple workers. But again, uh, what this means is that now these other workers can go into another area of specialization. That is why we have so many different industries in the current century than uh, centuries back. And um, um, essentially, taxes on the rich thus hurt the poor. And so this idea that, oh, a, a landowner or a uh, capitalist entrepreneur can just take less of a profit and give some of it to, um, uh, you know, if we impose rent control, then the owners will still have a fair profit. But again, this fair profit, this concept, it is of no description um, of, of prices. Uh, it doesn't, um, it, it completely is, it's a complete intervention in the economy. And um, profits are a byproduct of a, uh, a productive 
good or service in in um, in uh, a capitalist market economy where exchange occurs. And so if you eliminate the profits, then you can eliminate the industry altogether. And going back to this menu, if we impose a, a price control on breakfast burritos, I'm going to find it maybe on the other side. Uh, no. It was very good. Um, but essentially the, 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 the price of a breakfast burrito is $9 and 35 cents. If, if I wanted to impose a price control on breakfast burritos and I wanted to make it $8 or even let's just, uh, exaggerate. We, we made the price of breakfast burritos $2. Um, now, uh, what they'll do is they'll take the ingredients of the breakfast burrito, the eggs, the potatoes, the pico de gallo and the cheese. And they'll say, okay, it won't make us any money to sell breakfast burritos at $2. So let's take those, um, factors of, of, uh, those accumulated factors of production, those resources that we have. And let's just use those for our other, um, uh, dishes. And so now they might take those, the ingredients from the breakfast burrito and say, okay, we can still sell our tamale and eggs for 1255, our huevos ranch shells for 1125, our, uh, 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 garden omelet for 1265 let's just take those ingredients and put them in these other uh entrees so what this hap what happens is you essentially eliminate breakfast burritos from the market altogether it's off them they'll just change the menu they'll remove breakfast burritos now now they had the the also the more specialized options with the breakfast burritos if you want it with chorizo or sausage or bacon or with carne asada with beans um and so forth but now the option of breakfast burritos is gone completely so now i was trying to help this get to everyone and it's been removed and so this concept of interventionism creates a distortion the distortion the intervention was you lower the price of the breakfast burrito the distortion that occurred, that resulted, was the elimination of the supply of breakfast burritos altogether. It's more profitable. This is why market prices are so important because economic calculation, scarcity calculation, depends on uh, the 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 scarce resources that are in a society, and um, when you intervene in this process, they'll get allocated in a different way and it's less efficient. And uh, what happens with each distortion is the government will come in and try to impose another intervention. And they'll say, oh, well, maybe we'll... Um, uh, okay, so this, this is going into the failures of interventionism, the reaction to the failure by the government. What happens when the intervention fails? And the breakfast burrito or the milk or the housing is eliminated from the market altogether. The government may respond with more intervention. Uh, going back to milk, milk sellers under price control complain that they can't make a profit. The government may respond by imposing price controls on their suppliers to lower their cost. So um, let's say the, 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 the cow farmers, they have a price control now. of They can only sell their cows or their milk for a specific uh, price to the producers and so forth. Um, but these new interventions will also fail. It won't be profitable um, to be in that business or that line of work. So if the government responds with still more interventions, this will lead to total total government control of the economy. And this took place in Germany in World War One, which was the Hindenburg Plan, and also Britain in World War One and World War Two. Churchill brought socialism to Britain, not the post-war Labour government. And so now, uh, understanding this idea of scarcity, which um, um, is very important in any society, uh, let's go into a little bit of history now, discussing the post-1936 uh, Germany with their Nazi economics. And the notes I have from David Gordon are, although the Nazi regime kept the form of private property, it was a type of socialism. And uh, this can be described as fascism or prices and wages were set by government directives. Uh, the Nazis determined 
um, uh, who can produce what and at what price they can sell their products to. And the Marxist interpretation of Nazism is that big business was in control, but actually the government ran things. Um, it looks legally like you have private property and private businesses. Marxists say this is a higher stage of capitalism or capitalism with the gloves off. So it's the illusion of of private businesses that make it appear to look like a capitalist society. This is why people on the left will say that Trump is a fascist uh, because he's a capitalist um, and that he's a Nazi uh, because he's a capitalist. But actually, the National Socialist, uh, National Socialist Labor Party, I believe is the accurate title of the Nazi Party, um, they 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 were national socialists in uh uh in soviet russia they were international socialists and um with the national national socialists uh the the government had such a tight control of of interventionism in every nook and cranny of the economy and it they regulated so heavily that this was ultimately this type of control was ultimately another type of socialism. In the under communism, uh, this was the abolition of private property. You had the government owning um, the means of production and uh, and uh, capital. It, it was um, public ownership of goods. But in Nazi Germany, you had this illusion of title saying this is private property and private business but due to the heavy regulations and interventionism this was what is known as fascism or a, a, another type of government control and so this in hence is a is a type of socialism and that's why it's so important to have capitalism a capitalist society is because even if trump is a fascist and um, he's labeled a Nazi. Uh, it it it's still another type of socialism, which is still hurting the people. Um, regardless of who becomes the new president of the United States, with the heavy regulation that goes on, it, it becomes less and less of a market economy. It becomes a crony capitalist economy, or a mixed economy, or an interventionist economy, or a uh, a form of a corporatism uh, economy where you have these quasi monopolies heavy, heavily regulated, so it ultimately eliminates the barriers of entry altogether. And it's under the guise of capitalism that's coming from the Marxist saying, "Oh, this is this is because capitalism that things are so expensive." But really, this is because of heavy regulation. You look at housing, colleges, um, um, uh, food. Um, essential goods and products everything is so expensive because of all the regulations because of uh the the cartels that are able to be formed when you impose tariffs and these protectionist laws this isn't capitalism and i don't think that people should be confused um with these terms of 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 they should be able to understand that no no, no what capitalism is is uh a voluntary exchange of goods and um, resources for for money for monetary compensation including your own labor uh, but when when all these prices are set this is no longer a a true capitalist market economy society this this becomes just heavily regulated government control and that's what's so dangerous is even if we have government control even if we have fascism then you still eliminate the different meals from the menu. Now, breakfast burritos are still eliminated. Those those scarce resources of eggs, pico de gallo, um, uh, potatoes, those go into different dishes. And if we keep regulating uh, the price of these dishes, then we're going to have menus with one or two items. And now, only a couple of people are going to eat there. And if you already ate there, you're not going to want to eat there because you ate everything on the menu. And then you completely eliminate the selection uh, from people's lives of of choosing what they want to eat. You should, in a capitalist society, have more options, not few fewer options. You should you should have the options of who runs your life. 
you know, we start with this these debates. You have 15 candidates. And then as time goes on, you have less and less candidates. This is the complete opposite of uh, what what a, a market is supposed to be. You should be aligned with who you want your um, protection style to be, who you want your, your foreign affairs to be. Are you supporting a person who drops bombs and starts a genocide? in with the saudis in yemen or are you trying to be someone who says hey we got to bring the troops home it's not our problem we're not supposed to be the police officers of the world um this these are the types of ideas that get uh convoluted and and masqueraded as um everything that that i believe in liberty capitalism um peace this 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 is uh destroyed and it's destroyed uh, definitely by this Marxist lens, and I'm I'm excited next week to go into why you should not be a socialist. Thank you. <laughs>